Women Matters in September, the end of September, 2024. And we thought about talking about loneliness, as Gina re reminded me. Unfortunately, she is not visible today. There is some bug with the video camera. Too bad, because we are missing your nice face. <laughs> <laughs> we will have to find out. Uh, just listen, listen, listen. For me, it's more difficult to, to listen and understand when I don't see the person. Somehow the movement of the of the mouth makes it easier for me to understand. Anyway, we start with a check-in. Uh, yeah, Gina, that's good. Leave it like this. <laughs> okay, how you how it is. Monia, would you would okay. you like to start? Well, um Monia from Vienna in Austria. And the weather is has calmed down. <laughs> the rain has stopped, the flooding has stopped, but there's a lot of work still to do because some of the districts were really severely damaged. And yeah, it will cost a lot of money, millions and millions. Mm. And some like a, a butcher, a very ex an excellent meat producer. The whole, everything was flooded, and even his trucks were flooded. Mm. So it's mm. it's really extreme damage. And we will have elections um, next Sunday. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's. It's really strange. Uh, politics are just amazing sometimes, and everybody thinks they will. He will win, and all other think think he won't win, and so it's just yeah. It keeps us on our toes, depending on whether we try to exclude an almost majority of the population because they are rightists, which isn't, it's just that they are not left. And, uh, but because there is another party that is in the middle, so they have to be right. And, but, but you can't be right. You have to be extremely rightist. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, yeah. And this is what I guess all of Europe is concerned with it right now. And one of our former chancellors said that to exclude a part of the population is just wrong. You can't exclude anybody because in, in particular, if they have almost a majority of the people. So that's, uh, yeah, it's very, it's very unsettling and uh, I'm wondering about post-democratic situations. This was a topic that came up in our recent salon, Integral Salon. Uh, what is post-democratic? Is this actually something that's better? The way we now live democracy? Maybe it's... So we still have to find out that this is, will be a topic in our next Integral Salon. Uh, yeah. I'm fine. My husband isn't too. We were out on the street today and shopping and going to the bank, and it really it's strenuous for him, and that upsets me too. But that's the way it is, and we are going to manage. Christine, I'm passing over to you. You are still in the morning, and everything is fine. <laughs> It's the morning here in Carlsbad, California, and uh, yeah, another day, another week. Um, things are pretty good here. Uh, we're waiting for our election, but we've got longer to wait. Um, if people don't die before it happens, I don't know, maybe. I don't. <laughs> uh, the craziness is just almost unspeakable, but um, what else? Uh, I don't know, getting ready to be out of town for a little bit, 
Um, we're going to Las Vegas for a few days because uh, Tom's college football team is playing in Las Vegas. <laughs> so he wanted to go see them. They're on, his college is on the East Coast, so it would it's an unusual opportunity to be able to see the football team. So we're going to go to Las Vegas for a few days to see that. And then we come back for just a few days. And uh, Anise is getting married in Massachusetts. So we'll be off to the East Coast and stay with my sister and see a lot of family and friends back there. So looking forward to that. Um, wanted to see uh, Suzanne uh, Cook Reuter, but she is going to be at the Africa conference because we she's in the town next to where my sister lives so we've often gone to see her um but she'll she's in south africa for the conference um and also touring around so that's good because she had said years ago she was going to stop traveling so yeah. a good thing that she is able to um to do that i think she's 76 77 at this point so she's yeah that's good um, yeah, not a whole lot else. I've been trying to, I'm, I'm putting my toes in the water to participate in, uh, helping with the election, uh, phone banking. Um, I'm going to do a training this week. I don't know that I'll be able to do it as a poll watcher in Nevada, but that's another state. And I don't know if I'll even qualify to do that, but I'm going to investigate it and see because i just feel like if this election doesn't if if trump gets reelected i will be very mad at myself that i didn't participate or try maybe futilely <laughs> to do something uh to help the harris campaign so anyway um and i will pass off to lorraine thank you uh, yeah, the election really dominates here as well. I mean, when I say as well, I mean, uh, based on what you said, Monia, it's, it's ever present. And there is that, especially from that integral perspective, what might follow democracy now that the fear, I know this is sort of not exactly my personal life, but it, it becomes, it feels very personal because it's terrifying to think that in our situation, it feels like what would follow democracy is back to autocracy. And that's the real fear, you know? Um, it's like what Germany dealt with <laughs> in the 1930s. You know, we have a we have fascism on the rise. And it's really truly terrifying. Um Monia, it's interesting that your group was considering from a more open-minded situation what might follow democracy. And that it, I think that's a really important question. But in our country, it feels like we'd be going backwards. And we have left behind, it was like you were saying that one of the people running for office says we can't leave anybody behind. And that's really true. I mean, the far right in this country, I think... Um, came from a lot of neglect, you know, uh, and a lot of trauma. And our, our nation shrank the institutions that could have supported them. So that all feels very much in the air and very, very scary. So you might find us knocking at your doors and we're all moving to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> so, trying to get my EU passport lined up so that to facilitate this. But anyway, on a personal level, I'm putting my house up for sale and that should happen in mid-October. So mm -hmm. the next time I speak with you, I may be homeless. Who knows? Uh, at least for a while. So... Um, and it's a big decision because uh, part of what I leave behind is remnants of my married life. And so that becomes, you know, kind of a psychological step and a kind of a growth step. Uh, and that feels like a really good thing to do, even though I can't seem to find a place I like. <laughs> so I'm not going to worry about that. I'll put my stuff in storage and I'll go sleep on people's couches for a while. I don't know. <laughs> or rent a place, you know. 
So it's a lot of sudden activity and preoccupation. And part of me loves having all that stuff to do. And, you know, part of me is wondering if this is the right thing. So I carry that hope on one shoulder, doubt on the other. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm at. And I will pass it on to Heidi. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, Europe is not better. We are already yeah, yeah. in a pre-fascist state, pre-totalitarian pre uh, governments. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't know. It seems to be worldwide. Mm -hmm. And uh, also all this election stuff. <laughs> It seems to be ridiculous in some way, and so I, I'm, I'm curious, Monia, do you do this uh, online? Then I will come and join you this uh, salon, uh, talk about the post-democratic. We're doing it on Zoom, yes. You can good. So invite me. You're very sure. welcome. Mm -hmm. um, I'll okay. send you the link. Okay. As soon as I have it, because it's usually. Good, good, good. two weeks before mm -hmm. great yeah i'll good. take it out okay and to me i'm i'm quite fine i'm still in the same situation as before people come and go and my dream to have people stay <laughs> has not yet come come true mm -hmm. my olives are have uh, four more weeks and then i start with the olive harvest and i love to be outside so my vegetable for the winter is already planted and starts growing. And um, yeah, altogether, I'm fine. I have to say, really, it's it's good with all the preoccupations going on, but they seem to be on another level. They seem to be some somehow present, but not touching me too much. So, yeah. I would uh, give over to Gina. Can, no, we cannot see. And I see also Victoria has come. I hope your camera is working because Gina is not working. So first Gina and then you. Okay. And then you can put the video on. Thanks, Heidi. Um, so yes, uh, it is a, a foggy day here in Victoria. We, we have been promised uh, uh, good warm weather in 24 degrees range, but it seems that that's not uh, coming anytime soon. I've had a interesting week. Uh, I finished week three at school, and mm -hmm. I think I'm adjusting to it. Uh, uh, it. It is different, but I'm looking for different ways to cope with that. And one of the ways we coped is we took all the plants that we bought last week and started getting them to the garden on Saturday. So that is helping our garden recover from the winter kill that we had. Uh, early this year yeah so I'm you know I'm a little tired but I'm happy to be here with uh, all of you and to have this conversation and to just sort of be with people in terms of elections we have uh, two going on so at our provincial level uh, this this fall and federal next fall we're we're a little bit different uh, in Canada in that we're very concerned about what happens in the states but at the same time, we also feel like there is some erosion of what we consider our basic rights, but we're far more subtle about it. So it sneaks up on you versus is right in your face. So we we have a far um, more uh, influence uh, from our, our First Nations, our Indigenous Inuit and Métis people, uh, and how we're coming to terms with reconciliation in our country. And that is... That is going to cause people on both sides to be quite uncomfortable and we're not really sure where that's all going to end it's a challenge and uh, occasionally i've thought about gosh my my uh my son's in the uk i'm like maybe i'll just go live with my son but you know for now we'll stick with canada because we've actually got it pretty good here okay and i'm passing it over to victoria is that right mm -hmm. yeah there you go victoria nice to meet you can you open your camera, Victoria? Hi, yeah, yeah. I'm in the middle of a, a huge project here, so I may have to go on and off um, sound and camera. Um, unfortunately, it's a, a, there's a lot going on right now. Um, I haven't met Gina before. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, Gina, could you introduce yourself too? Or, or oh, is I thought, it? I thought we, 
I thought we actually did meet. Now I see you. I actually recall you. Oh, um, it was two weeks ago. Oh, I'm sorry. So okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Uh, so Gina from Victoria, I've known Heidi for many, many years through her Wisdom Factory group. Um, and I'm going, you may remember, I'm going to school. I'm, I've re-entered school at the master's level. And so I'm integrating into a very diverse uh, university, studying aging and uh, learning as a way to deal with loneliness, depression, and social isolation for older adults. Wow, fabulous. Okay, well, I apologize if I met you before. No worries. I that's okay. I must you have can been see her. That's the problem today. Oh, maybe if I saw you. Yeah, I'm very you visual. You can't see me. Yeah, yeah, sorry about that. That's my camera. I've, I've been playing with it, but I can't. I've done everything. I'm just not going to be disruptive anymore. Okay. Well, anyway, thank you. Um, so let's see. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I was in a, in a, um, I'm taking a course, a, well, it's just a four week course. Um, be not afraid. Um, taught by Peggy and Larry. What? What? You were frozen. C continue. Go. You can't hear me? No, we couldn't for a moment, but now we can. Oh, okay. Oh, all right. It's probably the room I'm in. Um, well, all the rooms are noisy. I'm trying I tried to find the least noisy room right now. Um, okay, let me know if I wave or something if I freeze again. Or I well, okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um okay. Um so, oh, so I'm taking this course called Be Not Afraid, and um, and it's all about, uh, well, it's a Buddhist, it's a Buddhist couple that worked with Thich Nhat Hanh for 25 years, so they're the teachers, um, and her approach is totally about somatic experiencing and getting rid of trauma through somatic exercises and interventions, and his whole approach is very, very high intellectual, spiritual philosophical so they're a really interesting couple um in many ways he's african-american and she's um comes from a catholic midwestern background so in every way they're like polar opposites are really fabulous um anyway what i realized yesterday and i'm realizing it again today unfortunately is that um i'm operating at like panic mode all the time i'm and my level of anxiety is so high i'm having to work like minute by minute just to keep my feet on the ground. It's really, um, so, so it was interesting when Lorraine twice, you said the word terrified and I, and I immediately just like went into, I mean, I'm not saying it to blame you at all. I, I, I know exactly, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm here too in the thick of the pre-election anxiety. Um, but, it, but I'm just I, I'm realizing that I need to do a lot of work right now to to keep myself um, balanced and grounded. And interestingly enough, um, there, there's so much drama going on in my immediate immediate situation that the political situation seems very remote to me at the moment, even though I'm I'm obviously um, anyway, that just occurred to me uh, when you said the word terrified twice, I thought, I thought, well, I, I do feel terrified, but what am, what exactly am I terrified of? Um, and actually the, yeah, the only other thing I wanted to say um, is that because I've been mulling over it now for, for the last three days, um, I was in another one of my groups and, um, and was put in a breakout group with a woman who, um, who said that she believes that the whole world is suffering from trauma because of um, the pandemic. And she said something really interesting. Um, I mean, maybe everyone said it at some point, but it really struck me and, and sank in. And I've been thinking about it for quite a while, uh, the last few days. She said, um, we, we, you know, we deny grief anyway in our culture and we never give time. And I've lived through that. And my daughter's lived through that. And that's why we're still, you know, still battling to come out from under the trauma of the, the losses we've experienced, the, the grief, because we're never given time to grieve in our culture. It's just move on, get going, get back to work, get back to school, get back to, you know, daily life. 
And, um, and so that what this woman said that really struck me was she said, our whole planet is going through this and it doesn't matter what the circumstances were. Sorry, that's water. (laughs) I'm in my laundry room. Um, she said, it doesn't matter what the circumstances, um, were for us personally during the pandemic we the whole planet went through it in one way or another in one experience or another and and as soon as it was uh possible to get back out and to work you know then the masks were off or whatever it was just go you know get back catch up with where you left off you know catch up for lost time make more money go back to work and so um so she attributes the all the hostility and anger and rage and frustration that that one sees at least here i don't know what it's like in europe but um she used starbucks as an example she said that uh because i guess she goes there every day and she said before the pandemic people were just falling over themselves oh uh, how can i help you today what would you like and you know the really the customer friendly thing and smiling and and gracious and explaining what the things were the choices and she said now you go she goes into the same starbucks and all the employees are huddled in a corner complaining they're complaining about the employer about the customers the customers are so obnoxious they don't like the customers or they're tired or there's whatever and she said the whole the whole mood is so dramatically different and this is the same in her experience the same place that she's been going for years so I, anyway, I just wanted, sorry, that was a really long check-in, but um, I, I just wanted to um, respond to this, this, the, the terrified, <laughs> sorry to keep saying that, but you said it twice and I thought if she says it a third time, I may have to leave the call. Okay. Thanks everybody. I have a drama right here now with flooding. So I'll be, I'll go off. Uh, thank you. Okay. So I'm here. But you gave me the, the possibility to tie back to the topic because it's not only the pandemic, as you call that. Uh, it is long before that we went into separation, 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 separation. And this uh, COVID uh, time, it was accelerating the, the separation of people. You know, the, uh, the, um, in, in the distance between one and the other should be a meter or two or something. I mean, more extreme, you cannot separate people from each other, you know. And before already, uh, people were very lonely, especially older people. And with this, what they did, I don't know how it was in America, but in Germany, when the first cases of uh, COVID seemed to have happened, uh, then uh, old people died alone in the old people's home and were not allowed to, in the the family was not allowed to 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 assist them. I mean, more loneliness cannot be when when in the dying you you are not uh, cannot say goodbye to your your family. And I found this really very 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 cool. So Gina, we were t- you want to 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 say something about this loneliness topic as you are? Uh, st- yeah. So. I think that what I found really uh, challenging is that this was apparently for our, and I'm going to use the term seniors because it's more, this group can probably handle that. Um, The fact that not only were they kept from their family, they were kept from each other. So they were essentially put into social isolation in their room. And the most contact, even if you're on a ground floor, you, you could touch through a window, but you couldn't actually experience human touch. So loneliness took on not just real access to people, but not even within the confines of this restricted uh, setting. And, and the people who were fighting and fighting and fighting to bring, um, to change those rules. I mean, caregivers could go in and they could, uh, put on protective clothing, much like uh, we do in uh, ICUs, but that wasn't going to be enough. And yet the damage that we've done to to those people, plus the access of their children and their grandchildren, not to have that those conversations, normal conversations with um, their elders. I, and the fact that we didn't fight that, that this was for our own good, and we had to collectively respect something for our own good like we wouldn't even let children play on playground equipment anyways it, it just it just 
the fact that we didn't uh, that we didn't have a stronger voice it concerns me that somebody is, the state is telling us what is our good when in fact I think the damage is actually irreparable for older people and I think that as you say uh, we're all having a real entry re-entry re uh, challenge and I don't think that people appreciate that so I think to uh, to Victoria's point it assumed that you could just go back to normal quote normal so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah that's my thought but anyway, all these experiences, and this especially leaves a trauma in, 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 in everybody, even in us. I mean, we have changed. Every one of us has changed by this, um, how do you say, extreme ruling of our totalitarian states. I say that very, um, uh, how, how do you say, drastically, but that were totalitarian measurements which they have imposed on almost everywhere. In places like Italy or even maybe in Africa and other places, they find a way to go around it, you know, and uh, I did certainly to to not, um, to, to continue my life, let's say, in other words, uh, but... Yeah, the loneliness, I could feel it too. I had my animals here, you know, but I didn't go to certain uh, places where they asked masks because I was strictly against masks and strict. So I put myself out of uh, the still possible communication <laughs> because I don't want to talk with people who I don't see the mouth. So as I said before, Gina, is for me, it's much more difficult to to understand uh, without seeing the mouth, <laughs> the people, the faces of people. Anyway, but my loneliness during life, I, I know that I have a lot of loneliness in me since childhood because I was not right in some way. So, and I was different in the family and so that's automatically creating loneliness. But I think also my sister and my brothers have this ground feeling of being left alone. You know, after the war, the parents were still shocked uh, from what had happened. They didn't talk about it and they didn't uh, grieve about it. And we are the generation who grew up in silence, but also in distance. They, they were not really near our parents. I don't know how it is with Monia. She still experienced some, some some war, no war uh, years. So it is not only the COVID time is a collective experience, but it's um, also in in war maybe not. But I don't know. My personal experience is this. So I would like to know what your take on this is on on loneliness and how do you. Well, Heidi, you are of course right. I had a lonely childhood, but I was overprotected by my mother and my grandmothers. And uh, listening to you, uh, I noticed I'm not lonely anymore. Uh, contrary, I am swamped with attention from everybody, the family, uh, my friends, and I have to sort of fend for myself to get some space to be by myself. Uh, of course, my husband and I are together 24 hours a day. And he then sits here where I'm now, sitting now in the study. And I'm in the living room or on the balcony. Uh, because otherwise uh, we would be just, yeah, it's, uh, I don't mind being by myself when I don't find it lonely when I'm by myself. Um, and as a matter of fact, we now started to invite people for conversations to our home because my husband doesn't go out anymore, quite well, hardly. And we had quite unusual conversations. 
because I tried to introduce this kind of uh, letting somebody talk and then let it sink in and then you respond to that. And they were not used to that, but we had a really very deep conversations. So maybe I'm just stirring against the whole uh, movement as it is now, because it's not my, my experience. Um, yeah, I was uh, recommending just to Victoria a book I just read, and it's really fascinating. It's by someone who is very depressive, and he had several breakdowns, and he's called Matt Haig, and it's uh, Notes from a Nervous Planet, because it says the whole planet is very, very, as you've mentioned it, very, very uptight. And uh, as a matter of fact, we had a soccer game yesterday, and it it when it ended, there was so much fighting on the by the fans on the playground, and they used fire and bomb. It's a, ridiculous. So it's this is now a generation that never experienced the war, as you said, and uh, yeah. It's really, you can get very apprehensive about how things will develop. Okay, that's just my take on loneliness. Uh, as I said, uh, being by myself and loneliness is different. So uh, maybe we could just distill what makes us feel lonely. If you could try, uh, Christine, what what makes somebody feel lonely? Um, probably not having a emotional or spiritual connection with anything. I mean, because being alone is different, and a lot of people tolerate being alone just fine. Um, I don't mind being alone, but um, loneliness is more like feeling you don't have connection. Maybe friends are not responsive, um, just feeling adrift. And I, as people were talking, I was thinking for myself, I've got uh, FOMO. And I don't know if you guys know what FOMO is, but it is F-O-M-O. F-O-M-O. -O. It stands for fear of missing out. And this is one of the sayings that the kids have, which, uh, you know, is basically you want to do stuff. You want to be a part of things. You don't want to be left out. You want to be a part of things. Um, and I definitely have FOMO, but I don't, you know, it's interesting. I don't mind doing things by myself, but I want to have experiences. So, it's not that every time I want to do something, it's that I'm desiring to get away from loneliness, but I do want to feel like I have a life that has some vitality, some connections, some enjoyment, some pleasures. Um, and when I hear about things going on that I'm not a part of, <laughs> I get FOMO. <laughs> so there's a difference I guess the uh, I'm going to go back to what you asked Monia which I guess is just not feeling a connection makes us feel lonely like we don't like things are going on and we have this perception that people are doing things people are connected with each other and we're somehow left out of that um, and it, you can be with people and feel that way or you can be alone and feel that way yeah thank you Does anybody else get FOMO? <laughs> I, I'm, I've got a, a chronic case, big, big time FOMO, um, which I'm trying to work on. It's, it's. I noticed yesterday was a perfect example that um, uh, the church where where we attend daily mass, um, we're not members of it, but we go there. It's it's close by. It's a very very poor, very very poor church, um, and. Um, and so a big 
project lately has been gathering things from my mother's um, house and taking them to the warehouse for the church and they had their fall festivals. So we donated tons and tons of stuff, um, mostly shoes, yeah. My mother was like Imelda Marcos um, <laughs> in her shoe <laughs> collection. Anyway, um, so that was that was all weekend. And then yesterday, um, a, an acquaintance of mine who's an art, a local artist was having an open house at his studio from 12 to eight. And and then the, this, it's called the Lemon Festival because it's in Lemon Grove. I think your sister lives in Lemon Grove, Heidi, if I recall. Um, so I had a horrible day of FOMO because I was worried that I didn't know what was happening hour by hour at these two events. And both of them were open events. You know, one was a, you know, like a carnival, basically, the one at the church, where it's not like there, there, there wasn't any like schedule of performances or anything that I was going to miss. But I got obsessive about um, missing, you know, what if I miss the results of the lemon baking contest and then I can't try the winning <laughs> cake which I did I actually like calculated so here it is um <laughs> this is the win the winning cake um <laughs> so I I bought some of that and then I had to leave it with the lady in the refrigerator because I had to rush downtown because I was scared I was going to miss the most important part of the artist's open house which again was an open house where people drifted in and out I didn't know anyone except for the artist himself who was there from 12 to eight. So what was I worried about? The art wasn't going anywhere. Anyway, that's just an illustration of like yesterday was, it should have been a joyful, fun, upbeat kind of a day. And we've had so much drama and stress and agony lately that I should have looked forward to it. But instead I was, even the night before I was in a panic, like how are we gonna coordinate this so we get the right window of time for each of these? events which are meaningless events I mean not meaningless but I mean it's not like I had a lecture to go to or a performance or something so anyway that's my example of FOMO it's, it's very pathetic so my question is this FOMO has it to do with loneliness it's the psychologist or Gina I think I think that if you think back to like a childhood thing about even just choosing teams for basketball. Um, who gets picked first? Who gets picked last? You know, those things started very early. Or if you had a cliquey school and, you know, were you on were you on the cool kid side or, or are you on the sort of, well, not fully accepted, but tolerated side? And so I think those things start fairly early. So <clears throat> whenever I've done my uh you know what is your profile do you do tons of these personality tests when you go to work for people what always shows up for for me is the importance of relationships to me and the importance of re relationships means that every time i encounter a group i want to be accepted and i want to feel belonging but normally that translates into me caring more about the relationship than the people i'm with so i attribute more value to it than than they do so uh, one of the things I've, and particularly as a consultant where you're coming into people's teams and into the work environment and it's not permanent, but, you know, I, I don't have, well, I, in my work environment, I have to create those relationships on, uh, on the fly. And so I want to be friends after the contract, you know, I want to still be there, but then I find, well, I don't really have that time. And so what becomes lonely is when you don't have, as you, I think you alluded to earlier, Christine, like, you need someone to to connect with when you're having those feelings. And and if you have someone to connect with on a super happy day or a super sad day, just somebody who will take the time to listen and be with you, I think that makes a difference between loneliness and being alone, which I agree with um, Monia. Those are can be very different feelings. I, I don't mind being alone, but I don't want to feel lonely. That's my view. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I uh, I remember uh, growing up. I was I was the oldest of four, and the oldest of thirty cousins. And um, there was a loneliness in 
not being with people who were at my level, uh, you know, and because of age, um, uh, I found that when I wanted to talk about something that was really bothering me or something new I was trying or something I felt anxious about, um, that I couldn't turn to my siblings because they hadn't been through it yet. And I couldn't turn to my cousins because they hadn't been through it yet. And yet when I when I sought out the adults, they didn't have time or they didn't have the ability to just sit down and listen, except for my mother. She was a fabulous listener. She just was too busy to do it. So there was a kind of loneliness there. I, I didn't notice it. I just thought, well, that's life. You know, that's that's what it is. Or I would be with my younger sisters and they would be chattering away and fighting and doing all this. Stuff. It was just noise. It was just noise. And I just wanted to get away from it. So it was like back and forth between that. But I didn't realize until the first time I was in therapy and I was already almost 30 years old that someone could really listen to you and reflect back what you're saying. And it was like, oh, people could do that. People do that. You know, it was like a big revelation. So is it an, any wonder I became a psychologist eventually? So, but, but I carried a piece of that loneliness with me, I think throughout my life. Um, and then when my marriage broke up, um, and a lot of that was because we really couldn't communicate. I mean, he really couldn't. He really couldn't get to what he was feeling or put it, put them into words. So it was a mystery. And um, not two months after we broke up, um, the pandemic started. And oddly, the pandemic was a relief because... I don't know if you've experienced this, but when I am grieving a loss, I want the world to stop. And then it did. <laughs> so it was an odd pocket I slipped into there, um, which helped me personally uh, until it got to be the third year. <laughs> you know, it, then it really got to be too much. So. Yeah, so I've had an interesting relationship with feeling lonely, wanting to be alone, and just feeling like I didn't know who to turn to, to, um, you know, talk about what I really needed to talk about. And as a result, I didn't learn to talk about some of these feelings until much later in my life. I, I just didn't know how, because people didn't in those days, you know. So, yeah, it's been... It's been interesting. And of course, FOMO was part of that. I mean, there was definitely, because then other people, oh, they seem to be having a great time. And why can't I get into this frame of mind? It was more like that, you know, fear of missing out on the feeling you get when you're doing things with other people. So there was that piece of it, too. <laughs> So as you were talking, I, I was the youngest in my family, yes. youngest of the cousins, youngest of my siblings. And so my FOMO arose because I saw my brother and sister who were closer in age. So mm. they got to do a lot of things at the same time because developmentally it, it fit. And I was too much younger to participate. So, you know, they were having parties and sleepovers and this thing and that thing, going to dances or whatever they were doing in their lives. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> I want to do that. So of I wanted course. experiences, but I also wanted, um, I, it, as you were talking, Lorraine, I was thinking, you know, maybe I was just so dependent on the external world to get my pleasure and happiness. Like I, loneliness maybe is not only about a connection with people and relating, but also, to what extent do you need external forces, whether they be people or situations, 
to generate your own pleasure and joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. So I think that can be also a component of loneliness. Can we be by ourselves and still feel, um, generate our own joy? And that's, uh, I don't know, that's a skill. It's, it's not that easy to do. <laughs> it's a well, skill. Well, I was an only child. No. So I had all my books as friends. And uh, yeah, that makes a difference, I guess. Yeah. For me, it's for instance, it would never come into my mind to to travel alone because I need somebody to talk about what 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 I feel, what I'm what I'm seeing, what I'm discovering. For instance, when I went now, it's five years ago to South Africa to the conference. I knew there were people I know already, and we went uh, on the on the tour through South Africa, and so that was possible for me. But I probably wouldn't have gone there without having known anybody of of these people. It's it's um, I'm not very how do you say in in traveling because I just can't, uh, and that is also good because it's meeting my my sedentary life and, and my enjoyment of the changes in nature and so on. I'm not very excited about traveling, but I'm I'm missing out <laughs> on many, many things for sure. But this is not, that's not the point. The point for me, I want to, to connect with people and to share. And um, I don't feel lonely when I have at least one person, as I had, for instance, with Mark, uh, where we were very much together. The, uh, I always had a relationship with only one person, m m men or women, I mean friends, you know, with mostly one person at a time. And I see the danger for symbiosis in this case. So uh, I'm not yet quite sure if Loneliness and symbiosis are the choices. <laughs> or if there is a way of deeply connecting with uh, or feeling not lonely with people who you are not having this complete relationship. I mean, it's much better now. I'm I'm very much more able to, to be with people just you know, without deep conversations and so on, but up to, let's say, 10 years ago. And I I, I must say that the therapy things and the, the, the courses and the coaching courses and everything, it really helped. Without that, I probably would be closed egg. So thank you to the psychologists <laughs> that you do your work. Yeah, I agree completely. I but I just wanted to add my mother, um, who was who could be quite nasty. Um, she used to say, you know, psychology is is because she had she had millions of friends, and it was interesting because she always said friends are good for nothing, because I would talk about friends as people who will come to your aid if you're in trouble, who will comfort you in sorrow, you know, real companions. And my mother said, oh, that's nonsense. She would just blow it off. And she said, friends are good for nothing. And sure enough, when she got sick, there was nobody there, nobody there to help her, no one to take her to the doctor, no one to take her shopping or bring her food when she got so sick, she couldn't leave the house. Um, and I thought, how ironic, you know, she was right. Because I never anticipated that. She was always surrounded by friends and people calling. She was on the phone all day long. And the other thing um, that she said that I that this makes me think of is she said, you know, the only way to really share your troubles with someone is to pay them. She said, you have to pay someone to listen to you. And she said, that's how we got psychology and therapy and counseling and all these careers. She said, it's a sign of the modern world. There was no such thing a hundred years ago. Well, or whatever, 120, whatever, before Freud. Um, 
she said that's the sign that you know th our culture has changed our society has changed and she always maintained that and um and she only once she agreed to go with me to a like a family therapy session and at the end she said like a real narcissist she said I think he really liked me don't you and she said and I think he liked me better than you don't you think <laughs> and I thought okay I won't oh my god this. <laughs> really oh dear narcissists oh. so that's the story of my mother <laughs> oh, oh. You know, I don't know if you guys participate much in in podcasts or blogs or something. Um, I I'm not doing that for no particular reason other than I I read books instead of listening to podcasts. But and I don't have anything I want to blog about that I have such strong opinions. I feel like putting it out there into the world for everybody to see. But obviously, a lot of people, especially since the pandemic, it has just become. A, a part of everybody's daily life. And I do think they use podcasts to feel a connection because you can select what you want to listen to. Obviously, that's going to make you feel like it's your thing. And uh, Tom is always blogging about politics and integral and other things. And I think he feels a sense of, he does have a sense of connection. Um, and it's grown his connection with a lot of people through the internet. Uh but I don't, I don't know. I don't enjoy that so much. Some people do. Um, and I do think it's become so prevalent as a way of feeling connected because we're not doing it as much in person. It's an interesting point. Yeah. Sorry. I, I think it's, what's interesting is that um, I certainly appreciated uh, exploring relationships on uh, the internet, um, but in some ways, it it's not as deep, or is not always as deep as it could be if you were actually sitting with someone and actually being very mindful and truly listening. And I think, you know, like one of the things that was it was told to me about the difference between Canadian and urban or uh, European culture is if a Canadian says, how are you doing? You go, I'm fine. And it, you might not be fine, but nobody ever takes it past I'm fine. Whereas my understanding is as in some European cultures, if you say, how are you? You actually tell people how you are. You sit down and you listen and you take whatever time it is. And maybe that's a, a fantasy that was created, but um, I found that, um, actually giving people that time and being present for people took a little bit of discipline on my part to actually do that. And, and I think that's when you can really have that sense that, you know, your loneliness can, it, it takes away the loneliness if you can feel that a, a true connection versus a superficial connection. Yeah. That's true that uh, you can say uh, what you, you you are not obliged to say, oh, I'm fine. You can say, oh, but today I'm feeling a little bit blah, blah, blah. You know, that's, um, that's true. So Heidi, is, has it been your experience since you are doing a lot of things? And I, I believe Monia is also on the internet. You have salons to go to and various groups that you're interacting with on a regular basis, you know, like this one every two weeks and you've got others. Has that, how does that fit for you in terms of improving any sense of loneliness or your connectedness? For me, it is important to, to have the recurring uh, uh, meetings and have know the people better and better. And on the internet, normally I, succeed to have deeper conversations than in normal life. In normal life, it's about cooking. Now the persimmons are mature. Do you want some persimmons and things like that, you know, or a bit small talk and at least the people here around. It's not that you can, you can scratch the surface a little bit, but you cannot go deeper because you don't know how people would take when you say, what you what you think yeah, about certain topics, if it's political or whatever. So 
more cautious. While in, in a group like ours, we have this silent agreement that everybody can say what they want to say, you know, and even if you, I'm not agreeing with you or not with you in certain topics, but that doesn't matter, you know, and you are not agreeing with what I say. Uh, but this is, this is not uh, touching the relationship we are creating. It's a, a free uh, expression of what we think in the moment or what we feel in the moment. And this is not necessarily possible with, with the people I have around, not even with my family, even less. <laughs> Probably I see them very little. But on the internet, I really feel feel much connection and some of the people I know in person, some I don't, but it doesn't seem to make a big difference. And the recurrence is important. Even the, I have the Tuesday group of German women, you know, and we every Tuesday and every Sunday we meet and um, not they're different, not all the in the same yeah, different people sometimes on Sunday, on Tuesday, but this recurrence and this meeting, oh, that's it's deepening, deepening the connection. And for me, it's brighter because otherwise I would be really lonely. <laughs> so I'm not lonely. I'm alone often, some of the time, most of the time, but not lonely. Thanks to the internet, thanks to Zoom. Well, it helps if you know someone personally and then you can meet on Zoom. This makes a lot of a difference because uh, some of the integral people I know, most of them I know personally, and when we meet on Zoom, it's different. Because, uh, yeah, when, we, when you sit together, the conversation can go much deeper and deeper. And of course, it takes more than an hour and usually when you sit together and you eat something and you talk so it, you can sit for four hours and it doesn't seem but on the other hand uh, as we did last on friday everybody was sort of the next day rather tired so it really was a challenge to go in person deeper and deeper but none of us would miss it. So it, it was really a new way of meeting someone live. And that's, yeah, we'll see if we will keep that up and if we can stand it, we'll see. Yeah, but it's not someone who you are meeting. I can meet here someone, but you are meeting people with a certain... Uh, yeah, integral people, yeah. Developmental evolutionary state and yeah, stage, uh, and this is a, that makes the difference, and not so much in li life or 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 Zoom for me. Yeah. And all of us are read people who read. We, we were talking about it, and everyone was saying, "Yeah, well, I have thousands of books in my library, and so we are people really who read." Uh, and not just read something, but exchange with the author our ideas, and that helps also. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to, in two weeks, all the elections, our elections will be passed, and we'll just get interested in the USA elections and yeah, I'm, my daughters are American and one has registered. Uh, so the, the older one has registered, but the younger one, yeah, it doesn't matter. Anyway, so they are also interested in what's going on in the States. They have double citizenship, so they can vote there too. And they have to pay both taxes, twice the taxes. Yeah, probably. But <laughs> <laughs> when you pay, uh, pay as much taxes as you do in Austria, there's much left to pay in other countries. Well, we pay a lot of taxes in Austria. We do, definitely. Yeah, but as do soon you know as... What, do you know what state they would be voting in? I mean, not physically, but what state they're connected to? 
Uh, New Jersey. New Jersey. Okay. I believe, yeah, that's where we lived mm -hmm. when they were born. So in New Jersey. Mm. So how do we close this loneliness um, conversation? Is anybody lonely of you or only alone or both? <laughs> you have to go. You are not lonely. <laughs> he is in thousands of I think, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think uh I think what I'd like to do is just express the appreciation for this time together and for bringing us together. And, um, you know, Heidi, our, our relationship did start online and uh, I feel close to you. And so I, I do believe that's possible, but I think maybe we can just close it and gratitude for the appreciation, appreciation that we can come together like this. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's nice. Nice. Everybody be well. See you again in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I wanted to say, I, except of Lorraine, I have seen everybody of you. And uh, I don't see much difference. Um, only Lorraine I have seen less. So I know less of her. But I think it's more or less the same. Uh, so Gina, I knew her before online for a while. And then she came over. And it's like, you know. Uh -huh normal <laughs> and i love you mean, that you mean you want me to visit you yeah sure in italy oh yeah. that would be so do it that'd be yeah, so do hard. it of sleeping you're homeless and... go <laughs> <laughs> that's right i'll over. be homeless anyway yeah do yeah when you have sold your house take take some time and come and see me well thank you mm -hmm. i will i will think long and hard about that <laughs> Okay, see you in two weeks. And okay. Jim, I hope we see you in, in with the camera then next time. Okay. Yeah. I will do my best. I'll figure it out. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. Bye. Nice to meet you, Gina. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.